So please join me in welcoming T. Boy. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you to Patricia for introducing me and uh, to, the, to Chicago for having me. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of a public school thing and um, not lecture to you, because I'm also very concerned that you have a good time today. Um, and I would also um, like to make this a little bit interactive uh, by um, asking for a couple of volunteers. Ooh, great. <laughs> You're perfect. So I need two uh, voice actors from the audience. Perfect. Um, what are your names? Izzy. Izzy and Aiden. Perfect. Could we get microphones for Izzy and Aiden that they're already sitting in a great place? You can actually stay where you are if you feel like you can read things from the screen. All right. So um, Aiden, uh, you're going to be my dad. <laughs> oh, wait, let, actually, let me, let me backtrack a second. I'll only introduce the characters to all of you, because this is a true story, which, as my mother says, means it's 99% true. Um, these are my parents, who I call Ma and Bo in the book, and these are my sisters, Lan and Bic. Really important to remember the pronunciation of Bic. Um, myself, as a little three-year-old, and this is when we first came to the U.S. in 1978. So Aiden, you're my dad, as a young man, as an old man, and you'll also be doing the sound effects. <laughs> and just to stretch you a little bit, you're also going to be playing Bo's grandfather and this neighbor. Cool? All right, you're going to be amazing. Um, Izzy. Izzy, you're going to play Bo's grandmother, who's a little bit of a grumpy lady, but for good reason. A small part is this woman, my sister Lan, my mother Ma, my sister Bic, <laughs> and also me. Cool? All right. If you mess up a little bit, it's totally fine. Um, I will probably mess up too. <clears throat> All right, everyone else, I'm going to take you back across time and space to a country that no longer exists. The year is 1955. The French have lost the Indochina War, losing their last colony in Southeast Asia. The international powers that be have divided the country temporarily into North and South Vietnam at the 17th parallel, causing a major upheaval for the people who live there. Many people from the South who want to follow Ho Chi Minh move to the North, and many people who are afraid of the change to a communist regime leave their homes and go to the South, an American-backed, more capitalist democracy. And among those people is my father, 14 years old, who's made, this, made a decision to follow the vision that looks more like what he's seen in American movies and is now uh, starting a new life in South Vietnam. I imagine the awe and excitement that I felt for New York when I moved there after college must be something like what my father felt when he arrived in Saigon in 1955. Bo and his grandfather were two bachelors exploring the big city. Money in their pockets, freedom on their minds. They strolled down Grand Avenues, ate at restaurants, and visited friends and relatives. When his grandfather wanted some time away from him, here's some money, go see a movie. Bo's grandmother arrived in Saigon separately on the last of the great ships from the north. Grandma! <laughs> Let's make a new home together. No, I don't need you. 
Bo's grandmother rented a flat with two other women. This way, Auntie. But fate would soon drive her back to her unfaithful husband. The South had a new prime minister named Goding Zim, who had yet to establish full control of the region. Saigon had its own mafia called the Bing Suyen, who controlled the casinos, the brothels, and the drug trade. Zim's forces fought the Bing Suyen in the streets of Saigon. One night, the fighting came right to the doorstep of Bo's grandmother. Ah, my opium jars. Stay down. Pow, pow. Plunk. With her securities gone and scared of more violence, Bo's grandmother agreed to go back to her cheating husband. Huh? Grandma? And Bo had a family again. They pooled their money together and bought a little house for the equivalent of $5,000. Five thousand seems pretty cheap for a house in the capital. It was really just the pla space between two other houses. Wait, I've got a paper. Can you draw it for me? Someone had topped it with a roof made of palm leaves. Inside, they lined it with cardboard to give it the semblance of the house. But to me, at age 14, it was a home, an address. This is the house I lived in, only a lot later. Yes, but by that time, they had added another story to it. It was still small and dirty. Do you remember it? No, I was too little. My first home. I went to see the old house with my family in 2001, the time that Bo refused to go. Travis and I were newlyweds. I had a, an impulsive short haircut. <laughs> the street had changed beyond recognition. Miraculously, an old neighbor still lived across the alley, recognized my mother, and came out to talk to us. Aren't you Nam's wife? There, that's your house. Oh, I thought it was that one. That was Mr. Khan's house. Mr. and Mrs. Khan lived in that one. No, that's Mrs. Du. He's right, Ma. Ah, that's right, Big. This is our house. We each had our own reaction to this homecoming. Lan already scouting ahead. Ma and Bic, the most excited. Me and Thum, documenting in low of remembering. We didn't know the people who lived there, and we didn't go inside. Even standing right in front of our old home, I had to rely completely on my family's stories to picture how it was when we lived there. I think this is the same shop where occasionally we would get a cigarette or two for Dad. This is where we learned to ride our bikes without hitting any of the vendors. This is the old coffee house where we would go out every day with our little glass and bring back some coffee for Dad with the condensed milk laced with opium Smelled really good. Click. Flan and Bick remember the alley where a friend lived. A lamppost that Lan walked into while reading. And the sidewalk where Bick beat up a boy for harassing Lan. Click. Lacking memories of my own, I do research. Lots of research. Hello, Thai. Tea. Tea. Thanks. I brought you a video I found. Vietnam with, with Walter Cronkite. It's narrogation and only, it's only okay. But what I thought was me was seeing footage of your old neighborhood. Really? 
Thank you, Bo. Hmm, if you like it, he, I'll get you more. Five days after the combat began, the enemy was still fighting. George Seaver's battle in one of Saigon's slums. I know this is caricature, but lacking memories of my own, I've come to depend on other people's stories. The Lower East Side, I'll draw it like that. I still have the chessboard my father made when I was a kid and the wooden set of pieces we played with. Revisiting this game of war and strategy I think about how none of the Vietnamese people in that video have a name or a voice. <clears throat> my grandparents, my parents, my sisters, and me, we weren't any of the pieces on the chessboard. We were more like ants, scrambling out of the way of giants, getting just far enough away from danger to resume the business of living. I'm gonna break from that and just read you a little page from the book before we move into a conversation. Um, I wanted to start with the humor this morning because it felt right, and now I'm gonna give you the other side of the humor and maybe you'll, you'll probably see why I did things the way I did. Every casualty in war is someone's grandmother, grandfather, mother, father, brother, sister, child, lover. In the decade of the first Indochina war, while my parents were still children learning their place in the world, an estimated 94,000 French soldiers, many of whom came from other French colonies, died trying to reclaim Indochina. Three to four times as many Vietnamese died fighting them or running away from them. In the war we call here the Vietnam War, and in which Viet in Vietnam is referred to as the American War, to distinguish it from the rest of the wars of the 20th century that happened there. Over 58,000 Americans were killed and over 3 million Vietnamese were killed. How many and which can you name? But we are here to talk amongst the living. So I've given you a story about lives lived between the bombs and bullets as a way to reset the balance out of desire to keep the living alive. Thank you. And can we have um, an extra round of applause for Izzy and Aiden? You did great. Um, and now I'm gonna call back Patricia and Nguyen, and, and we're gonna have a little conversation with each other before we open it up to questions from you. Thank you for all that. Um, before I begin, I just wanted to... Ooh, I'm gonna just Christian this <laughs> furniture here. So, so water, or nuke, in Vietnamese also means nation, homeland, and country, so... Diaspora. That was right planned. <laughs> um, but before we begin, I wanted to give a shout out to my parents who are both refugees who are sitting right there and joining us this evening and um, <laughs> or afternoon. Um, and um, T, it is it is an extreme honor to be able to sit here with you. Um, I had the opportunity to. 
um, grab a copy as soon as it was released before it was released in the pre-order stages of everything. And um, so to be able to kind of sit here and be in conversation with you and meditate on your practice, what brought you to um, this story and how you grapple with it is um, a true blessing in many ways. Um, so this weekend is significant. Um, in terms of many, many things, crossing borders, thinking about civil wars between countries that were um, proxy uh, wars during, during the Cold War. Um, yesterday, we witnessed um, the leaders of North and South Korea meeting each other and crossing the border um, for the first time in over 65 years since the beginning of it. And on Monday, on April 30th, we celebrate or not celebrate, we mourn, actually, um, uh, and we commemorate the lives that were lost um, for the 43rd anniversary of the end of the Vietnam-American War. Uh, your graphic novel traverses time, traverses space, memory, um, trauma, love, and care in so many seamless ways. And even in the ways that it kind of ruptures the, the, kind, the sense of time that we're able to enter, the sense of history that we're able to enter, um, it does so in a way that always centers and humanizes the voices of um, your family and the people who are central to the story. So I just wanted to ask as an opening question, how, how do you think about border crossing in some ways in, um, in your in your graphic novel in terms of border crossing of time, of memory, of history, of family? Um, borders don't make a whole lot of sense to me. Yeah. So I, yeah, I, I traverse them as much as possible. I suppose there's something contrary in, in me that if I see a boundary, I want to push it. Um, the, the way, I don't know, there's something about like the transnational immigrant experience um, that's very, uh, it's borderless, and yet it's so much defined by borders. Mm -hmm. um, people who cross one way can't go back to see their families. Um, people get trapped inside borders. Uh, family members of, in my own family history weren't able to see each other for decades, and we're only reunited after the war's end. Um, so I suppose maybe that's the reason why I like to, to traverse or to, to break down borders is because I, f I felt like they've caused so much pain uh, already. Um, and I guess that extends into how I feel about borders today. <laughs> uh, I guess like symbolic borders between genres and things too, I don't know. Like, I have the benefit of being kind of new to this whole writing thing. Um, so I don't know what I'm doing, so I just do stuff. And then if nobody stops me, then, <laughs> then I just keep going. Um, I didn't know, for example, like when I did a children's book, mm -hmm. that often the author and the illustrator don't talk to each other. I just started talking to the author and including him on all the emails. And nobody told us we couldn't do it. So we went against the grain, and um, we won a Caldecott. So, yeah, uh, it's, it seems to be working out. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's great. <laughs> um, uh, in terms of just thinking about, like, because so much of um, kind of the state of the nation in many ways is thinking about borders, and for, for you to reconceptualize it as just, like, even, even not to know that to these boundaries, ge geopolitical boundaries exist, but then to just break it apart in many ways, to question its very existence and the, um, the heartbreak and pain that happens on both ends um, when, when that separation happens. Um, I was, I'm gonna pivot a little bit and just ask a question about um, what, uh, so I read in a previous interview that, uh, and I, I loved how they kind of framed it in thinking about uh, it took over about four decades to kind of write this in some capacity out of like lived experience and kind of sitting with the story and, and being with family. I was wondering if you can talk about time and process and, and what it means to, to sit with the story and how do you honor the story in a way that allows you to tell it in the way that you did. Um, 
it's something that I hope to never do again, because I don't know that I have another 40 years. <laughs> um, but I suppose like when it's a big story that is, uh, you know, sort of your, your life's work is figuring out this heritage and, and what to do with it so that you pass on something clean and wholesome to the next generation uh, without taking away the wisdom that was gained through, through the suffering. Um, I suppose I, it, it seemed natural to me that it would be a slow process of mm -hmm. collecting, examining, um, paring down, mm -hmm. finding a, a narrative arc that made it all make sense which is quite therapeutic. I mean, that is therapy, basically, is making a jumbled mess of an experience into a, a, a cohesive narrative. Um, and so the process is kind of like distilling very fine whiskey. <laughs> um, so yeah, it took me a lot of um, er trial and error mm -hmm. to figure it out. And I have stacks and stacks of bad pages of comics that you'll never see because the editing process for comics in particular is really hairy. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit more about your process in terms of collecting your family's oral history um, and, and how you arrived at um, delving through interviews to archival research or historical research and um, how that kind of like blended in together? Um, I suppose it started as an origin story, or the search for an origin story, um, which is kind of a, it's an existential question, right? Like, who am I? Why am I here? Why am I here and not in this other country where I was born? So for me, the, the search for an origin story um, has to include history and the history of this war that was the catalyst for, you know, the Vietnamese diaspora. Um, I had access to two parents who, like yours, are willing to share their experience. I didn't know this before going around on tour that most people's parents don't talk to them. I was like, I grew up with the stories all around the dinner table, and sometimes, you know, the stories were really intense, and they would come at you when you weren't ready, like you were getting ready to go to school, and you'd learn something <laughs> devastating. Um, you're, you're nodding. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so it does something to you, right, to grow up with these stories because there's, like, there's such a disconnect between the intensity of those stories that mm -hmm. you know happened to these people that you grew up with and then how the, how the same people are perceived by this culture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your parents were this other kind of person in society before they immigrated and here you see them working minimum wage or unemployed. Um, seen by other people as not speaking English or not having a job or, you know, seen through their, seen by their deficiencies. Mm -hmm. um, you see yourself as in the minority, you see yourself not represented mm -hmm. in anything around you. Um, so I, I'm, di I'm digressing a little bit, but I guess the process of getting information from them was to fill that void, mm -hmm. was to, um, go straight to the source mm -hmm. and replace the stereotypes from bad Vietnam War movies that we sort of dreaded but would watch every time because we were hoping that every time that this would be the movie that would like tell our story and it never did. So eventually I just had to tell our own story the way that we lived it. Um, so it was a process of uh, just, for, I guess it started as a formal oral history where I would sit down like you and I with a tape recorder and then afterwards transcribe hundreds of hours of interviews and some of them I had to translate from Vietnamese as well. Um, and that was the academic beginning that then I had to translate into something a little bit more populist. <laughs> um, so the comic book uh, idea came early but it took a long, long time to teach myself that, that medium mm -hmm. and craft it to a, to a level that um, you all could read. You mentioned um, as you were, we were talking and reflecting about it that sometimes, and I, I also um, interview my parents and it's integrated into my, my larger work in some capacity and there are moments of, of extreme heartbreaking trauma that kind of mm -hmm. like surfaces up. And then it's like when we're 
my dad's driving me to school yes. <laughs> or, you know, right. uh, mm-hmm. or, or we're cooking or, or the, there are these memories of war that, that don't live in, a, in, in kind of a linear sense of time. They just kind of pop up and just spring up um, in, in, in these random moments. And, and so I, I was wondering, like, how you navigated that, like, um, how you were able to kind of hold space to honor what they needed to share and what they needed to say, but also... Emotionally, how were you able to process that? Um, yeah, it's, it's exactly as you said, that these memories come in, in waves and flashes, and they're not a, 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 they're not a faithful chronology of what happened. Yeah. So I guess like, I, I just listened a lot and mm-hmm. saw patterns after a while. It did help to, to, to transcribe cause, so I could go back and, and um, read, reread the interviews with a little bit of emotional distance, because when you're in the moment, you're just overwhelmed by the tears and, or the guilt or, or a combination of those things. And then when you have a little bit of private space to reread exactly the words that people say, mm-hmm. then you can see why these memories um, have attached themselves to this person mm-hmm. and why this person tells the story the way that they do. Mm-hmm. And then you can find the hidden themes, which is, I guess, like what, what brings me to the therapy part of this work is that sometimes these things are hidden to the speaker but more apparent to the listener. Mm-hmm. Um, so then it just becomes a process. Then, that, then it kind of goes into the narrative work where you, 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 you connect the themes to each other. And definitely the theme of how hard it is to be a parent and how hard it is to be a child of survivors. Um, that was a theme that you know, nobody said to me. But it became very apparent when I thought about my relationship with my parents, which has not always been a good one, and then the way that my parents talked about their parents. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, this is an intergenerational thing. And when I became a mother myself, I was like, oh. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it sounds like there's this, like, this kind of like ebb and flow, this push and pull between like the proximity that you have when you're interviewing and you're right there with them, feeling um, being pre- as present as possible in the moment, and then also this this critical moment of of also having to take a step back, a few steps back to reflect and and see where all the pieces kind of come together. Um, and and you talk so beautifully about family intergenerationally, and in terms of your parents and their parents, and then um, becoming a mother yourself. And so I was wondering, because you were working on this before um, you had your your, your son, right? Yes. Yeah, I did the, the academic piece before I had my son, and then I didn't start drawing it really until I, until I had my son. Just like not, you know, logistics-wise, it's not yeah. so smart. Yeah. But content-wise, I don't know how I could have done it otherwise like without that piece of empathy. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I got out of having small children in my life, because I had my son and then my sister, like, pretty much right after that had her baby, and then my brother had two little kids. Um, they're always running around my house, and mm-hmm. it's very disruptive, but then like, they found their way into the book because I had to draw other people as children, my own yeah. parents as children, um, and there's nothing like having you know, live models all the time to just you know, understand that a little child's head is like really big and their face is really small, or like the way that their feet, their toes curl when they sit you know, all these really sweet details that I was able to observe because of my life being the way that it was. Mm. Um, all those things found their way into the book. And I guess they also, I mean, since we're at a humanities festival, they also like, just really um, taught me a very basic lesson, which is that we are never ourselves for very long. We're mm. always in flux. So your parents aren't, your parents as you see them now, they are the accumulation mm. of all these experiences that they've had since birth and through childhood and through young adulthood, and, and all of their hopes and dreams are still attached to them. Um, and it's, it's up to you to peel back the layers to try to understand them. So that was a healing process for me, too, because there's a, my survivors are not easy to grow up with, and I feel like that's an important piece to, to, to restate. But at the same time, they've been through so much. Mm-hmm. So part of the healing process and the reconciliation process is trying to understand them um, and sort of hope for reciprocity, but that's, that's to be determined. 
And some, yeah. Um, I was wondering, like, if you can offer us a moment that was was challenging as you were writing it, either um, in the interview process or in the aftermath, in terms of writing a portion of it and maybe relaying it back to your um, one of your parents, and and just thinking about. Um, their, their own image of themselves and how they were portrayed or mm. a moment when it was like, wait, this, did I miss something? Or, or, or seeing it one way and they saw it another way. Like um, how, if there were moments like that that had emerged. Uh, yeah, can I actually get a sense from the audience? How many people have read the book already? Front row, yeah, <laughs> A pluses. Um, all right, I'm gonna change my answer then because I don't want to give a spoiler. Um, so there's definitely some personal stuff that was like hard to put in there and I wasn't sure if I wanted to but in the process of working with an editor um, my editor was like there's something here that you're not telling us mm. and after she said that a few times I was like yes you're right darn it and I had to put in chapter two you know a conflict that I hadn't resolved in real life yet that was very scary to me but the book is not a celebrity memoir in the sense that I've lived this incredible life and I sat down and wrote it out. It's more like it was a vehicle, an excuse for me to ask a bunch of questions that I had about life. So I guess in the end it worked out. Um, but there was another historical thing that I really struggled with and in the end I think I lost, um, which is that in the first Indochina war, um, my, my father told some really gnarly stories of what happened in his village. I just just awful details that um, I was having a hard time drawing because when you draw, it takes a really long time, a lot longer than, than describing it in words and you sort of have to embody it in your own head. Um, and then in my historical research that I was doing to provide context to my father's interviews, I learned that um, the first Indochina war was so unpopular in France that they didn't use French soldiers, they used soldiers from other colonies. So there were you know, black Senegalese soldiers and, 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 and dark-skinned like, Tunisian soldiers in Vietnam. So the racial dynamics of two oppressed people brutalizing each other um, was just too much for me to feel like I could handle well mm -hmm. in, in a small space in my book. And I had so many other things that I had to talk about because I knew more about them. So I'm just hoping that somebody else one day tackles that subject. But I had to, um, I had to nix it in, in, in my final edit. Yeah. It sounds like it's really hard like, to, to think about when you're, when you're given all this information, this deeply historical information that unravels all these other complicated transnational histories of war um, and, and, and racism in a lot of different ways. And, and I think that it sounds like it was a very ethical decision to, to hold back on it um, in thinking about what does it mean to really represent a particular history. And, and Yeah, I mean, I guess it was humbling, right? Yeah. Kind of like childbirth is really humbling. Um, puts you back in your body and makes you realize your limitations. Mm -hmm. I realized this is one book. I ain't gonna solve like the, the history of problems. colonialism in one book. Yeah, which is something I need to remember because I'm writing my dissertation and I'm thinking, oh, I gotta fix that. You're like, I'm gonna do it all, right? <laughs> I'm gonna do it all in 250 pages. <laughs> um, so I was notified a little bit earlier that we have, I have a few more minutes to wrap up this section of it. Um, and so I just wanted to ask you a question about your, uh, your next project. Mm. Um, what are your plans for it and um, what can we expect? Well, I, I was under contract with, um, with One World, which is an imprint of Random House, uh, to do a book about climate change called The Sea is Rising. And I, pitched it to them and they were very excited and I was very excited. I went to Vietnam to do to, the, to do the initial field research and I realized that it's actually a much bigger uh, topic than I had given myself time for in a typical fashion. I bit off more than I could chew. Um, and then I also, uh, in the last few months, got recruited into some domestic issues uh, also involving Southeast Asians. So I'm, I have, through 
you know, one thing leading to another. I have uh, right now incredible access to the stories of Vietnamese refugees who are now in detention centers waiting to be deported, some of whom already have been deported to Vietnam. And so there's this question of how did people, and it's not just Vietnamese refugees, it's also Cambodians and soon to be next Laotians, and actually this was a huge surprise to me, Amerasians, the children of American soldiers during the Vietnam War, have also been deported and are sitting in detention centers. Um, so I have to do something with all of this access that I have. So like with my parents' stories, um, somehow these stories have come to me. Um, so I'm squeezing in a book before the climate change book called Nowhere Land that involves going to a lot of detention centers here in America um, and just asking the question of how did these people who came as refugees end up in our mass incarceration to deportation pipeline. I think that's, it's, it's, I loved, we, we, so we had a chance to talk briefly yesterday too. There was a student matinee and um, I love that it's, it's, it's also thinking through the continuation of this as a book in many ways, this, um, the best we could do and, and, and the stories that happen afterwards, that it's not um, when a lot of the times uh, Asian Americans are, are trapped or are kind of cornered within this notion of a model minority myth where um, we've struggled, we made it, it's done. Yes. And in many ways, this story by picking it up in, in, in terms of thinking about immigration raids, deportation, and refugee bans that it's actually bringing to the fore um, the social injustices that actually are embedded in, in the histories that, that were already there before the, the Vietnam-American War happened and continue to kind of stay very present with us. Um, and so I think that that continuation is such a powerful and strong politically urgent piece that um, uh, I think we're all looking forward to um, reading and, and also um, what it means to, to center these voices, these stories, these narratives that aren't always captured just by a newspaper headline, that this, this form allows for something else, for something more. I hope so, and it's something that I don't know enough about, having gotten to live my life as basically a model minority, right? Like, but the problem is when you... Um, get put on a pedestal as like the, the successful refugee, the spotlight on you casts a really long shadow on the other people who came with the same, under the same circumstances but didn't end up with the same good stuff happening to them. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it's exciting because I'm stretching my own definition of what it means to be Vietnamese American, what it means to be a refugee. Um, and hanging out with some of these guys, I'm like, oh, you could be my brother. You know, I, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but this is expanding my, my understanding of what it means to be human, too. I don't know. I suppose we all come with different capacities, right? Mm -hmm. um, some people under strenuous circumstances rise and, and surprise themselves with mm -hmm. their resilience, and some people break. And then sometimes it's not their fault. Mm -hmm. So those are things I'm exploring in the next one. Thank you. Um, I don't want to take away too much time from the Q&A se section um, where we open it up to all of you. Um, and we have uh, Dana over there with a microphone. So um, if you have a question, uh, oh, good. I can see you raise now. your hand. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for that great talk. Um, I had a question about, uh, I'm teaching a class on race and ethnicity in American comics at the University of Chicago. And we, we just happened to have read your book last week. So cool. this is still fresh in my mind. But uh, one of the things that we picked up on was this like personal tension that you had with your own uh, Vietnamese identity, Vietnamese American identity. And I was wondering if you could speak a little about, bit about that and uh, how, it, uh, how you thought of it as you were uh, writing your, your comic. And if it, uh, I don't know if that's something that you, you felt or we were just picking up on. Um, I think I felt it more when I was younger. I think I spent a lot of time trying to figure out 
when I was younger, which parts of me were Vietnamese and which parts were American, because that's how things were phrased to me. So, um, you know, if I got in trouble with my parents, it was because I was being too American and wanting to go out. So like, suddenly, like, wanting to hang out with your friends was American, and listening to your parents was Vietnamese, which, you know, if you set up that binary, you're just asking for trouble as a parent. Um, there were other things like, uh, you know, that were presented to me as Vietnamese when I was a kid, but I just didn't buy it, because I was like, hmm. Saturday language school I skipped out on. Did you go? Yeah, we had a summer school. Well, my dad, he worked for the Vietnamese Association. Oh, so you, you had I, to go. I, I was like, it was like a... <laughs> but it probably means that your Vietnamese is good. Uh, yeah. I'm a dropout. See, I had to teach myself later. I was kicking myself for not going to Vietnamese school. But there were things like ribbon dancing for girls, and I was like, no, thanks. The dancing? Yeah, ribbon oh, dancing I, is like yeah. so not me. We were going to open with that. <laughs> It was more improvisational because we haven't had time to rehearse. <laughs> I thought you said we were doing a Britney Spears. So oh right, should. yeah. Um, but with the f no, with <laughs> with the the just, no that's <laughs> ethics of representation now. <laughs> yeah. well, so what I realized down the road, because you know the, the book took so long to do that, I did a lot of growing up, and I, I realized that I was kind of right when I was younger to rebel against ribbon dancing because I don't want to do ribbon dancing. I still don't. I was wrong to rebel against Vietnamese language school because that would have been highly useful in my research in Vietnam. Um, as it turns out, I'm going to you know, pay a lot of money to go to Vietnamese school next summer. Um, so I don't know. Part of that was my teenage rebellion. And part of it was me realizing that you know, Vietnam's a big country, and it's a whole culture. And culture is a thing that is living and is created by many people, not just your parents. So it's kind of dangerous to be um, an, a, a, in the diaspora and have your parents and certain respectable members of the community be the only ambassadors of that culture. Um, my parents thought that because I was rejecting so much when I was a teenager that by the time I grew up and the next generation was coming up, they'd be totally Americanized and this was like terrible to them. But what I see now is the Vietnamese American youth are amazing. They're embracing the culture in new and exciting ways and expanding it um, so, surprise, you know, culture is, culture is alive. Hi, um, I, you may talk about this in the book, I haven't read it yet, so forgive me if you do, but I'd love to know about your choice to make it a graphic novel, and was that something you knew from the get-go, or something you kind of came to as you were doing your research? Um, I suppose I experimented with a lot of other, with a few other mediums first, um, I almost flunked out of an, out of an MFA in, com in, in sculpture program because I was making work that was kind of hinting at some of these stories, but it was too narrative to the, to the, to the folks in sculpture. So um, I don't know. I got myself in trouble by doing a puppet play. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I'll tell you a story then. Um, but then when I was doing it in an academic setting, um, I was compiling it according to the rules of oral history, which are a bit dry, right? Mm -hmm. So I always knew that I wanted to find something that was more fun to read. And um, Mouse by Art Spiegelman and, per and Persepolis by Marjan Satrapi had, you know, really made waves, re recent waves at that time. And they were both amazing examples of how you can read the personal and political and historical. So I, you know, without those books, I don't know that I would have like, had the imagination to think that this could be a graphic novel. So I really, I owe a huge debt to them. Um, I think also I've, I've always loved film and comics, like writing a graphic novel is the cheapest way to make a film. <laughs> it's just paper and ink. You don't have to deal with the casting issues or, 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 or the cost of film um, or location scouting. Gosh, that would have been really hard. So this is basic. My, my little book is my revenge against all those bad Vietnam War movies that I grew up with. Sure. Hello. Um, I would love to see a puppet play that you <laughs> at some point. Um, and I was wondering, so the, the book, uh, I've read it, and I, I love how it's framed by the like 
the birth of your son and then like that little bit that you have about in the end about like him swimming. I don't mean to spoil anything. Um, <laughs> and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to um, why you wanted to frame it that way and, and ha have you let him read it um, and I, does he have any thoughts about it? <laughs> yeah, um, I think he's, he's read it. He, he's grown up with it. Like He's been looking over my shoulder at me, drawing, drawing it his whole life. So he was pretty happy when he could finally read it. He's a huge reader. He loves history. Um, I gave him like Larry Gonick's cartoon history of the world very young. And he's read the entire Showa series uh, uh, about World War II history from the Japanese point of view. Uh, so he's always loved learning history as stories. So this fight fits right in with him. And the bonus is that it's also his, his own family's stories. So um, he's pretty lucky, huh? Like, sometimes I'm like, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> he's, he's pretty proud. I, I, he's told me like he, he, he's recommended the book to his friends. <laughs> I, I don't know if he realizes that it's kind of unusual to be in a book. Um, <laughs> So that's, that's the bubble I have to pop one day. <laughs> Hi. My husband and I have the blessing of visiting your country last year, so we fall in love with the culture, with the people. And um, listening to you, I see two young, very brilliant women. And uh, I listen a lot about the influence that your parents have on you. So. What will be the three things that your parents excel as parents in order to have these wonderful immigrant children that we as a minority and immigrants should be doing with our children? Oh. <laughs> you want to start? <laughs> That's a beautiful question because like, it's really the, the ultimate question, right? It's a lot of pressure. Um, let me take a drink of water. <laughs> Okay, um, taking care of your siblings. Mm. I don't see enough of that here in America. I'll just be honest. Mm -hmm. Like, my, my parents raised us to like, take care of each other. So when I see siblings here like, allowed to like, fight with each other all the time, I feel so sad. And like, you know, it gets put in the movies too. And I know siblings fight, that's like normal. But like, I, w I just wonder if we create a culture of, of it being okay for them, for them to like, treat each other so badly. Whereas I, I definitely grew up in a culture where you were taught that the oldest one needs to take care of the next one, needs to take care of the next one. And while that's not always perfect, like it does create a lot of responsibility for the oldest child. My oldest sister has a lot of feelings about that. Um, I don't know, I, I suppose like uh, it made us very close to each other. And I think that there's also something about living in a democracy where we really need to learn how to take care of each other better. Um, but there's this, very individualistic streak in American culture, too, that is counter to that. So um, I suppose there is something about family and relationships that immigrants bring that might help us not tear each other apart here. Um, the other one is there's a resilience that I love so much. Um, my parents taught me to do a lot with very little, mm -hmm. and they taught me that it's really hard to, to defeat a person, ultimately. Because mm -hmm. you can get stripped down to nothing. Like you can lose your home. You can lose all your possessions. You can lose your standing in society. You can lose your language. And you, if you're still you, and you still have your hands, and your brain, and your heart, and, and your family, mm -hmm. and you can rebuild from there. So I suppose like, I don't lose hope until I'm dead. Um, yeah, it's, it's just a little hardcore, <laughs> but that's, that's, that's the other thing that my parents gave me. Oh, um, Your turn. <laughs> my turn. Um, I'm always astounded by my parents' ability to heal themselves in many ways, like, and, and going off of the, the theme of, of resilience, because when I think back to their story, having gone through war, my father having gone through re-education camps, with, which were hard labor prison camps after the war, um, being resettled or living in refugee camps for, for over a year, um, facing a lot of um, 
health and sanitation issues and resettling to a whole new country where they, you know, were relocated into um, a, a poor working class community in, in, in the inner city of Chicago and trying to make a life for themselves and, and, and being able to have gone through so much war and heartache and pain and still find faith and still find a sense of like ability to, to, to process all of that and let go. Um, my parents are Buddhist and um, I've been getting these like weird massive headaches. I, I attribute it to academia <laughs> and so. Uh, yes. Um, yes. Too much thinking. It's a lot of thinking, it's a lot of just being in here. And so, you know, it was, there was this moment where I was with my father and he had, um, he was driving me to school and he was like, I'm worried about your headaches. Um, and then he, he's like, I think you should begin meditating again. Mm. And he sits with me in the car and he just takes a deep breath in and exhales. And then this moment we share this breath together. And then I'm seeing, you know, like in some ways I think, oh, intergenerational trauma, it's the second and third generation that's able to heal the, the generation that came before, kind of process what happened. But here's a moment where my father, having gone through all of that, is now teaching his daughter how to take care of herself in this, in this life. And so just the ability to heal oneself um, and food, they're oh, always yeah. afraid I'm hungry. <laughs> and so they're always delivering food or like, yes. you know, eat, eat. And, and like, immigrants bring good food. It's really, it's, it's, like, it's yeah. like a lot of stuff in my mm. freezer, you know, because I'm not going to throw anything away. And so mm. I think there's something beautiful in sharing a meal, making sure that our, our young, our and each other are fed. This, this, yes. this is what you were saying about what does it mean to take care of each other and be there for one another. Um, and, and I think the common theme between both of us and our parents is their, their willingness to share their story. And I think that that's so powerful to know where we came from, to know our history, to know why, why sometimes um, certain gestures they do is, is a symbol of, a remembering, of, of how they remember home. And, and kind of connecting with that. Um, uh, because it's, it's simple, right? It's, um, but, but like everything from squatting, like cooking and squatting, um, to, uh, and, and, and that under, understanding as a, a relationship to the ground, a relationship to, to being rooted in some capacity, but also, also you don't need economic. Any furniture. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, exactly. So thank you for that question. Um, my question relates to what you just mentioned. Like, I don't have parents who are willing to open and share their stories. I hope that books like this, or uh, there was another graphic novel, Vietnam America. Vietnam America. So, like, I would bring these books home and, like, in the library, and I'm just really like, Dad, wasn't this a part of your past? Tell me more about it. And, like, I think your book gave me a good sneak peek of what his life was or what their life was coming here. But, like, um, they just, they just keep to themselves so much. So my question is, what can I do as a daughter to get them to share? And like sometimes I, I was a film major, so I'm like, I, before they pass on, I want to record their stories. I want to document it, may it be film or whatever. But how can I initiate them to help bring them about it? Because they, they just, besides coming home, them asking me if I ate rice, they don't really, we don't really talk much. Right. Um. Will they go back to, be, are they willing to go back? Yeah, I back in 2015. My mom didn't go back. Uh-huh. She's, she's, yeah, she's, but we, it's not helpful going back with them. Yeah. But we, I didn't get much stories. I was just like, oh, that's where, that's where we used to live. I think the art of the follow-up question is a good one to hone. Um, getting to someone to keep talking is, is a really good trick. Um, and sometimes, like, if, if, if people are intimidated by big questions, then you break them up into small questions and just sort of Trojan horse in your curiosity, you know? Like, when they, when they go, oh, that's where, that's the school that I went to, then that's a good time for a follow-up question, like, oh, how old were you? Or like, wh where was your classroom? Who was your teacher? Who were your best buddies? Uh, what'd you wear to school? Um, what'd you, did you eat lunch at school? Um, just really like everyday 
everyday questions like that, like nothing, nothing significant or weighty, you know, but just like concrete details, we'll get someone talking and remembering, or, or it's more likely to. It, it, it may be that there's a lot more there to break through, but I find that those asking the little details can kind of disarm people, because then they don't realize that you're after stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, photographs, if, in low of going to a place, photographs um, and asking just the specifics of who's in the photograph, where was this taken, um, what happened right before, what happened right after, or how somebody felt about something that happened. Um, those, those, I, I found those to be helpful to getting, to getting people to talk. Or sometimes you get them really mad. Like, you pit them against each other. <laughs> you say, you tell your mom that your dad said this about her, <laughs> or vice versa, and then they are compelled to tell their own version of the story, too. <laughs> I've done that. I, I'm the worst. I, <laughs> my mom wouldn't tell me everything, um, I, but I realized that she would tell my husband stuff. My husband's a white guy from Canada, and so she doesn't assume that he knows anything. <laughs> So she tells him stories with more complete detail. So I learned that I should just have her talk to him. And so we would do that while he was, we were in town and he would drive her to work with a long distance commute in northern San Diego. And I would just sit in the back with the tape recorder on. <laughs> There's so many tricks. You just gotta, you, it's the art of war kind of. You just like keep coming at them with different, different tactics. <laughs> Sure, good luck. Um, so we're actually at time. Um, uh, T will be signing books mm -hmm. right after um, in, the, in the lobby area. So if you haven't already gotten your copy, I believe the, um, they are selling books out there. And if you already have your copy, then you can get straight to the line. And thank you all for spending your Saturday Saturday afternoon with us, um, and I hope you have a safe trip back home. Thank you.